Good. Clara, can you start recording? Great. Okay, good. So let's get started. It's our pleasure to have a Quan, who is an associate professor of operations, information, and technology at Stanford Graduate School of Business, and also associate professor by courtesy with electrical engineering, uh, also at Stanford. And his research pre interest primarily focuses on understanding fundamental properties and design principles of large scale stochastic system using tools from probability theory and optimization with applications in queuing network, healthcare, privacy, and machine learning. So thank you, Quan, uh, thank for you. being our guest today. We are very happy to have you, so it's all yours. That's great. Thank you, Santiago. Um, so maybe I have to begin with an apology. Uh, I just told Clara that I actually came down with a fever last night um, and experiencing some COVID-like symptoms as of now. Um, anyway, long story short, I, I might have to uh, uh, cancel the meetings after the talk because I have an urgent care appointment. But that being said, I think uh, I'm very excited to share this work with you. I'll try, try to chill and just tell you what I can share and feel free to interrupt me. Probably I'll, I don't want to speak too fast <laughs> and apologize for breathing heavily at some point. All right. All right. So um, I'm actually very excited to present the work, especially here, given that there's so many uh, experts in the audience. And I want to preface by saying this is joint work with my colleague, Stefan. And it's very much of a um, preliminary work and work in progress. So any feedback is really, really welcome. All right. And again, I'm calling from Stanford, and today I'm going to talk to you about diffusion asymptotics for sequential experiments. All right, so maybe just to start out, um, the main motivation can be kind of summarized by this vague sentence, which is, we're looking for good asymptotics in sequential experiments. And I, I'll give you some example, like, what could be a good asymptotic, right? So maybe let's just go over what we mean by asymptot uh, sequential experiments. So in these experiments, you typically collect data and you collect data in such a way that adjusts future actions based on past experiences. Now, the adaptivity here automatically implies that I essentially have more degrees of freedom compared to uh, classical non-adaptive experiments where you have to pick the action beforehand. But in the meantime, um, we all notice that the adaptivity doesn't come for free. It actually becomes much harder to understand, analyze, and optimize the ensuing dynamics. So entire fields are dedicated to studying that, and we are not uh, an exception. We're also kind of trying to understand uh, such settings. Okay, so what's this talk about? Um, we'll introduce the so-called diffusion asymptotics as a somewhat unified treatment of a family of sequential experiments, which we call the Markov random experiments. And the Upshot is that this family actually includes quite a few popular algorithms, uh, as I will explain later. And then I will specialize the general results derived for this family to get some new insights and understandings of Thompson sampling. Um, I hope it's new, but, but <laughs> I could easily also miss some references. So please feel free to uh, point out. All right, so let's jump right into it. Time. Um, so we're looking at essentially for the purpose of this talk, let's just think about the standard stochastic K-arm bandit problem. So an agent has a sequence of decision points, one, two, three, da, 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 n, and n being the number of samples of horizon. At time i, <laughs> the agent chooses action A sub i, and an observer rule word yi. Now yi is drawn from a distribution, P subscript A, and with expected reward we call mu k for action k. Actually, I literally stole this notation from Dan's paper. So, uh, so that's sort of uh, the notation here. Now, it's important to realize that realization of yi is otherwise independent of all else if I know uh, ai, uh, which action was chosen. So it doesn't depend on the future, doesn't depend on past, it's the iid setting. Now, the crucial thing here is, of course, that action a might depend on past observations, and that's the adaptivity here. Okay. So the goal for the agent is generally to choose actions with the highest expected reward. Now, one way to achieve this is by minimizing the expected regret, uh, which is relative to always taking the best action. And nothing special here. This is the very standard notion of regret, which is how much uh, in expectation would I have expected to make with the best action 
over n periods minus the expected reward that I actually did make being a regret. Okay. All right, so any questions so far on the setup? This is a very standard discrete time stochastic ended problem. Not, not a Bayesian setting, okay. All right, so good. So this part, I actually wanna slow down a bit. I think it's a very important slide. It's a somewhat subtle point and honestly, not super uh, concrete, but I hope I can communicate that. So at this point, we have the experiment defined and we can start looking for good policies that minimizes regret. Now, we all know oftentimes in statistics probability theory, it's hard to analyze finite experiments. So people tend to take some kind of limits as system gets large or as n gets large. So one very obvious thing to do here is to look at the limit where n is very large. That's the number of experiments tends to infinity. So here we have a very cele uh, celebrated famous asymptotic, which I vaguely refer to as fixed PK large sample asymptotic. And it essentially literally says that you fix the reward distribution PK from the get-go, then you let N tends to infinity, you pull one more arms, and then you see how RN scales. Now the famous Lyon Robbins result says RN actually scales um, exactly as log N with some tight constant in front. And this regime is fairly well understood. Okay, so at this point you might conclude, interesting. So. I have a large system, I let n go very large, I get some kind of asymptotic object, namely Rn as n goes large, and this asymptotic object should look like log n. Well, except for it doesn't quite work like that. So there is another branch of literature equally well known, which is what I call the finite sample worst case bounds. And notice here, I did not include the word asymptotics because it's not explicit in the formulation. So here you actually fix some n, any n, and you would argue that for any n, there is some universal constant C such that there always exists a bad reward distribution. And for this n, the regret is at least C square root n. Uh, I think the earliest result I know of from Euler et al, but it could be even earlier than that. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, so if we just stare at these two, there's obvious discrepancy, clearly log n, for what it's worth, it's not equal to square root n. So of course the subtlety is clear here. One is you fix the distribution, let n scale. Then the other one, you let n scale, then you find a distribution. Now, I think this is the philosophical question we wanna ask. What is a hallmark of a, a good asymptotic? Well, it depends on the situation. If you know for sure your uh, instance is fixed and n is extremely large and it gets larger and larger, then I think the Robin line is totally fine. But what gets trickier, is all you know is that n is large and you would like to find some asymptotic object under which the regret of the asymptotic object should match the true regret. So uh, let me give you one example. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question about the, <clears throat> about the previous slide. Uh, is it a constructive example for the worst case bound? So there is one, yeah. Okay. It's and typically, I think Dan will be the expert or uh, you typically have all arms being the same and one arm slightly different than other arms. Okay. And that will give you the tight bounds. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so, so let's put ourselves into the mind of a practitioner, which is now you're supposed to run some trial or some experiment and you get 1,000, uh, 100,000 samples. But other than that, you have no idea. You have no idea what the means are, uh, where they can be, now, which asymptotic should you use? Should you take a log and get five out of this? Or should you take square root and get 300 out of this? And even with 100K, which is not that big, I mean, it's already pretty big. With 10K, I think it's something like five versus 200, a four versus 200. So the, the difference is big, even for a moderate number of samples. Okay. All right. So now the na natural conclusion after this thinking was, well, there, there must be something that this, Fi um, fixed P asymptotic is not capturing. And namely, it's not capturing some sense of finite sample analysis if you're allowed to kind of take worst case over parameters. Well, that's where we started. So we're just wondering, can we find better asymptotics for, for this kind of application for finite sample analysis, just like you would using central limit theorem for estimating uh, the mean of a Gaussian or a random variable, okay? Now, um, and the answer is we, we do believe that at least in some regimes, 
this so-called diffusion asymptotics can be a very powerful object for such limit analysis of finite sample analysis. Okay. All right. Any questions so far, just at the high level? Okay. Okay, so what I'm gonna introduce next is how do we scale the system? What regime we're in? And moreover, um, our analysis is not gonna apply to every single um, sequential experiment. It will be restricted to a family, so-called the Markov experiments. Okay, so when we take limits, this is a sort of a inspired by how we take limits in queuing systems and stochastic modeling. We're imagining a sequence of instances as n scales. Now for notation, each instance has n samples, and I'll also use subscript a uh, superscript n to denote the distribution uh, for rewards for that n. Okay. Now here's the key to our scaling. Essentially, what we do is we let the reward distributions change with n, and in such a way that exactly preserve the difficulty of the learning task. So somehow the difficulty converges, and I will make this more concrete. It converges to something, the object that's well defined. Okay, so here's how it goes. So we will first fix some uh, constant mu k's. That's so-called normalized uh, mean regret, uh, mean reward. And then a bunch of sigma k's, that's the uh, variance. Now, as I scale the system, in system n, my actual mean, regret, uh, mean reward will be mu k scaled by one over square root n. So the rewards get smaller and smaller, or the gaps get smaller and smaller. They're equivalent. You can just center everything by the smallest arm or something like that. Meanwhile, the problem variance, the reward variance actually stays constant. It does not go down to zero. So it's actually a quite challenging task. Your signal is going down at a specific rate. Your noise is just constant. And here, just to flash, everything I'm going to say from this point on only requires these two assumptions plus a bounded fourth moment. Now, why bounded fourth moment? Well, simply because I'm not very good at proving central limit theorem. Uh, it might be <laughs> improvable. I just kind of grabbed the easiest proof there is. So you probably remember from undergrad uh, probability theory that if you prove CLT with the fourth moment, it's kind of easy. But for our purpose, it's probably not too bad. All right. So um, a few distinguishing features for this approach and this kind of scaling. Well, number one, I should definitely acknowledge, in fact, many in this audience have worked on this. Um, this is quite inspired by insights from two fields. And one is a heavy traffic diffusion limit and scaling in queuing theory, where essentially you approach criticality, arrival to traffic, uh, to service rate, and the gap becomes small at rate roughly one over screw n, where n is the time price. And um, there's a huge literature on that. And on the other hand is what I sort of mentioned that using CLT to study uh, asymptotic, local asymptotic normality in, in statistics. So that's kind of inspires this type of limit. Now, another feature, which I think is important to point out is that this is so-called a non-trivial limit. So if you scale this way, you will later see that the belief about mu k, your estimate of arm, whatever you define as estimate, never concentrates. You just don't have enough data to be sure what the rewards are. It's actually pretty easy to see. Even with one arm, this will give you a Gaussian at the end. Okay, So your belief is actually genuinely uncertain. And as a result, we believe that this is actually a pretty important regime for what we call moderate signal applications, where your signal is not that strong compared to the sample size. So you're probably trying to catch some uh, clinical trial signal, and maybe you have 100,000 people to try it on. So if the signal is very small, then you're in trouble. Uh, and luckily, I think for <laughs> Pfizer, it's like 95%. But let's say if we're like 1%, then we kind of are a bit worried. Okay. And finally, uh, just as a side comment, remember I said, I'm looking for a limit that sort of reconciles the screw root n scaling from a worst case and, and, um, and, uh, and, and that whatever you spit out from the limit. Now this limit, as you will see, actually does that automatically because your rewards are at the scale of one over root t, uh, square root n and the horizon's n. So one over square root n times n, you get square root n. 
So if you ever get some non-trivial limit here, you in some sense already get square root n. So what I mean here is in some sense, this limit actually is the limit for those counter examples that Julian is talking about, sort of targets that regime. Okay, all right. Okay, so now let me introduce a notion of the Markov experiment. And this is very important and sort of like a, it's a driving horse of the framework. I'm gonna make a, what appears to be very severe restriction for now. So I want to find two state variables, the cumulative frequency, which is number of times I put arm I, uh, arm K by time I, and then cumulative reward, the number of rewards I've collected from arm I, uh, arm K by time I. <laughs> Sorry, I keep messing those up. All right, so now when we say we're conducting a Markov experiment, we mean that the probability of sample sampling arm k at iteration i is solely a function of q i minus one and s i minus one. In other words, my actions only depend on the paths through q and s in the last round. The frequency plus the reward. And now on forward, I will call this mapping phi the sampling function. It's a mapping between q and s to what I'm gonna do as a probability distribution. Now, the significance of this development is that we now have a Markov process. You can show that under the scheme, Q and S form a Markov process, and that will allow us to introduce all the tools and the machinery uh, that will to come. So, Quan, I was expecting this also to depend on the time period I, so that you can compute fractions and so on. Can you do that in your model? Very good question. variable or something like that? So I will give some examples of this thing. Uh, the short answer is in this particular form, no. Um, but I think the reason it's not, is not fundamental. It's simply because as a first step, we're doing a time homogeneous diffusion or time homogeneous experiment. So you, I, I'm pretty sure you can build the time dependency like UCB um, or any kind of scaling over, over little t into the model, but we haven't done it yet. I think it's more technical. Okay. So right now you cannot uh, use like UCB algorithms like computer nope. algorithms. For the purpose of this paper and talk for now, let's just say it's just uh, the Q and S. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. All right, so let me give some examples of this, this thing. So well, what kind of uh, experiments can we model with the Markov experiments? Well, luckily uh, a very popular uh, experiment called Thomson sampling with a conjugate prior fits perfectly here. So with the conjugate prior, you can update the posterior of this algorithm. It's a Bayesian uh, heuristic. Uh, and again, I think Dan is the <laughs> expert here. Uh, you can update it without using anything else but the cumulative frequency and reward as I wrote before. And the second one is a, a best armor identification uh, version of that, uh, also DC and uh, Sutman. And that's called exploration sampling, which sort of is a variation of Thompson sampling. Now, there's other stuff you can do with this. Um, some of our less known. So for example, you might wanna do something called exponential weight temporal greedy. So here you simply go uh, S divide by Q and you just say, um, this gives me a sense of like the quality of each arm and I sample them proportionally to that. Doesn't really have a good interpretation, but it's like a heuristic. And finally, there is something called the loosest rule that's studied in psychology and behavior econ, um, which we looked at before, it's even simpler. So it's a hypothesis that people react to choices in the future simply by choosing actions they had good experiences with in the past, more likely. So you sample proportional to Q, uh, K, uh, uh, sorry, S of K um, with some regularization. So the list can kind of go on, right? you can play with this. Um, but as Santiago pointed out, I do want to say that the popular heuristic EXP3 and UCB does not fit as is because of dependence on time. But we're reasonably confident either you can fit a non-time dependent version or build time dependence in, in the future work into the diffusion limit. Okay. And hopefully the, the results will convince you that it shouldn't be too hard to do. Okay, so now we're to our main results. 
And before I introduce the main general theorem, so this is gonna to apply to all such experiments, um, then introduce some notion of convergence. So for, for the system to converge, we already discussed the scaling of reward, but that's not enough. You also have to make sure the way you conduct experiments are somehow convergent. That probably is obvious because you can't jump between Thompson sampling and UCB and hope things will converge. So this is the notion of convergence we're gonna use, which essentially says this mapping sampling function phi n when applied to the kind of a scaled, uh, uh, well, actually this is the original QNS scaling. And if you just kind of recalibrate them, take the n to infinity, then this whole thing will converge to a function uh, psi of the scaled variable QNS eventually. I haven't quite introduced the scaling for QNS yet, but this is just a definition for now. Um, for, for, for our purpose, it suffice to just think that somehow psi n is a very nice mapping after some n, it just doesn't change anymore. Okay. Now, here are two very important technical assumptions. One of them is somewhat limiting and it gives me a lot of pain sometimes, um, but um, it, it can be resolved uh, at times. The first one is that psi, the limiting function psi is Lipschitz continuous. This turns out to be pretty difficult um, to tackle. Uh, in fact, you, you, later on, I will show you that you probably don't want your limiting function to be too continuous because it doesn't shut off arms well enough. Okay, so that's one. And two is actually okay. I think that's just some kind of technical thing that says essentially just make sure pi, uh, psi n converges to psi uniformly over compact set. And for any reasonable sequence, if the limit is continuous, this kind of happens automatically. Kuang, just a quick question to make sure I'm, I'm following. Can you interpret the definition of convergent sampling functions as basically meaning that if you were to sample every arm a fixed fraction of the time, the probabilities of, of sampling converge? Like if you, if you forced sampling at a fixed rate, the, the psi? Um, I think um, it's, it's sort of, um, I think that it's stronger. It says if I plug into a history that is self-converged in the appropriate sense, then the resulting sample and uh, probability will converge uniformly. Yeah, this is a somewhat complicated notation of UC. It's for all QS while you take this limit. But another maybe a check mark you can see is, for instance, in Thompson sampling, if the mapping that takes Q and S to action is like nice, like a linear exponential, this is generally true. But if for some reason you are tweaking it as N converges, this might not be true. Okay. Okay, so now let's um, actually look at the convergence. So I'm gonna fix some parameters for now. Uh, K, the number of arms, I'm not gonna look at scaling K. Mu, this is the normalized uh, mean, not the actual mean, because actual mean scales as one over square root N. This is just the constant in front of that, that vector. Sigma, that's fixed. And this sequence of mappings, uh, a sequence of Markov experiments with a convergence um, uh, sampling function. So now this is the key scaling. Now I look at every experiment and I will come up with two scaled state processes. I will first average the frequency by N. This actually makes sense because this is the fraction out of N samples. So the unit is between zero and one. And for the reward, I will average by one over square root N to induce the kind of diffusion scaling that we need. And a quick comment here is, if you notice, it's a very interesting process. Q is actually a fluid scale for those of you who deal with fluid limits, whereas S is in its natural diffusion scale. So your actions converge, hopefully I will show you to some kind of random fluid limit and your rewards converge to some nice Brownian motion. All right, so finally I'm gonna, so I scale the processes uh, vertically. I'm just gonna squeeze everything into a unit interval. And again, this is exactly the same scaling. You see heavy traffic, you see in heavy traffic scaling. So now the little t is gonna run from zero to one in the time interval. All right. Okay, so now finally we're at the main theorem. 
suppose I start with a initial condition that's just zero. Then as this n goes infinity, the scaled pair processes Q and S converges weakly to the unique solution of the following stochastic differential equation. And let me parse it for you. Here, Q has a drift of psi of the state. This sort of makes sense because Q is a frequency and psi is a sampling probability. So this is some kind of ODE governing the evolution of sampling probabilities and, and fractions of actions. Now, but the input to this thing is not just Q because that would have been the ODE. What makes this a stochastic differential equation is the fact that S actually is sort of a shock by a Ito um, integral. So we get DS equal to the drift, which is mean reward times frequency of picking that action plus a uh, diffusion term, which also as intuitive as can be. So you see the square root of the action and you see the sigma of the uh, reward variance and you get the dbkt, that's some kind of driving randomness in the, in the process. What is really cool here, I think, is that the dbkt actually encapsulates both randomnesses in the reward and in the sampling. So it's all just lumped into that one thing. And here, bt is a k-dimensional Brownian motion. So it's, a, it's actually a quite pretty process in some way. Now, as a byproduct of this theorem, you get something pretty easy to prove. And this is what justifies why this is useful. It simply says, if you have some nice bounded continuous function and you apply this function to measure something about Q and an SN, then the expected value of the function will converge to the expected value of the limit. So imagine F is like measuring regret at time T equal to one, then it says it's pre-limit expected regret converges to post-limit expected regret. So then we can sort of forget about the pre-limit and derive insights from the limit alone. And that's what it justifies. Okay, any questions so far for, for this theorem? Okay. Uh, so, so I have a quick clarification question. Uh, sure. So state descriptor Q comma S, it's an object then R raised to 2K, right? Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, I think we can, in principle, apply. Uh, I mean, UCB also fits the description here because if we just sum over all the Qs and multiply by n, that would basically give you the total number of the cumulative number of pulls uh, until that time uh, in the nth uh, instance that you're considering. So, uh, except yeah, it's, it's actually very possible. Um, I remember having trouble with just building the time dependence here. Other than that, I. I don't think it's a big issue. I think the log n in UCB might be okay, but the mm -hmm. fact that it depends on little t in UCB could be a, a bit problematic. And also it might just run into Lipschitz continuity uh, problems because psi may actually be an indicator random variable in the limit. Absolutely, yeah. So you have to kind of smooth out these kind of UCB style algorithms or okay. epsilon greedy. Even epsilon greedy is not continuous in some way. Okay, got it, sure, thanks. Yeah. Hong, I have a related question. Um, sure. Uh, and maybe you'll get to this, but um, if I think about Thompson sampling in this framework, it seems to me the size would be hard to write down because they relate to the maximum of, you know, these random variables and so on. Um, so I can see that they might exist and satisfy your conditions, but uh, can you actually write them down and, and uh, in close form? Um, uh, uh, great question. I'm actually going to spend half the time talk about analysis of TS, um, but as you said, it's actually very complicated beyond two arms. Even with two arms is very hard. So I'm gonna cheat later and show you what we call one arm Thompson sample. Um, oh, and hopefully I will convince you even there is, something? what's that? One deterministic arm and one random arm or Exactly, something? yeah. So you, you will see some cool stuff. I, I think I can promise that there. All right, cool. So indeed, um, this is in fact a, a, a general theorem, but as you all pointed out, uh, it could be a little hard to apply in, in, in practice to derive analytically psi. All right, so um, another result I want to tell you about, which I think this is really the kicker, um, in the sense that after we wrote down the first result, which is great, and this is sort of like a theorem slash corollary, right? you need to do some work. But once you have this result, it's a powerhouse. So all the results I'm going to tell you about Thompson sampling, the proof is derived by what I'm going to tell you next. And furthermore, if you look at this one, 
probably flashback of like terror memories of uh, first year grad school stochastic calculus. Like I am not very good with it. So I look at it as like, oh, wow, this is like some Ito stuff then um, you, you have to go back. And it's not very intuitive somehow. Like, uh, I guess, again, depends on the people. I'm sure lots of colleagues here will say, well, what's your problem? It's like a standard thing. But I would argue that what I'm gonna show you next is much more intuitive. So this is called the same diffusion limit, but driven by random time change. That was a pretty cool result. So the same exact thing I showed you earlier can be written in a much more sensible way. And you have to show that this is actually true. So here it's much shorter. So the same S and Q. Let me parse it for you. S is equal to Q times mu K. All right, that's the mean drift plus sigma K times W of Q K T. So you can imagine W is measuring how much randomness on this arm you've accumulated so far. And the amount of randomness here is of course just saying, well, I pulled this arm QKT many times. So it's as if I'm progressing on that particular um, Brownian motion by QKT amount. Actually, I have a slight typo here. Uh, it should be W sub K comma QKT. It's a K dimensional Brownian motion. For each arm, there's an independent Brownian motion. Okay, so that's that. And then you have the same as before, dq is psi k sq dt, or q s dt, I forgot what I wrote. All right, so why is this useful? It turns out you can use pretty powerful, almost sure convergent theorems to analyze the dynamics of this w of q. It's much more tangible. Okay. All right, so that's the equivalent characterization using this what's called random time change. And uh, just to outline, W is a standard running motion. So that's also pretty cool. It's just a standard running motion in dimension K. Okay, so we have um, 20 minutes left, I guess. Um, great, actually feeling better with my lung. So <laughs> we'll, we'll continue. Um, then I'm gonna take the next 20 minutes to tell you about applying this to Thompson sampling. Now, granted, this is not a grandiose general Thompson sampling, but I still hope the results might be very entertaining for you. And showcases what do we do with all these abstract theorems. Okay. So consider the following one arm experiment. Um, in fact, it's two arm, but one of them is just zero. So in time period I, um, I can either draw from a unknown arm with probability distribution P, mean mu N and known variance uh, sigma, or I can do nothing and get zero reward, sort of waste around. So one application you can think about is I'm administering vaccines to people and I want to maximize the benefit of the vaccine, but the vaccine could also kill people. So I can administer up to N people and maximizing some accumulated reward in that process. So e each time a person comes in, I either inject one of the vaccine or I do nothing. I say, you know, you, you just go, here's a placebo or whatever. Okay, and at the end, I wanna do something good for, for this collection population. And the same exact diffusion regime, mu m is mu divided by square root n, while um, the sigma is fixed. All right, so very, very simple example. And let's look at how Thomson sampling works here. Um, just in case, I, I wanna briefly go over what Thomson sampling is, but I'm sure most people here know about it. So I wanna highlight while in, um, um, in the Bayesian bandits, Thomson sampling is at least kind of well-defined in the sense that there's a prior. But here, we don't really have a prior, so I will call that a heuristic. And this has been extensively studied as well. Uh, so now agent assumes that the problem instance, namely my mu and sigma, in fact, I guess sigma is known, just my mu, is drawn from some prior distribution. And each step, I pretend my data is coming from that distribution, and I just kind of uh, formulate uh, update the posterior. Then with the updated posterior, I sample an action AI according to the posterior, of the best action. So that's Thomas sampling. And I continue. So what does it look like here? So let's assume that the user, the agent uses a Gaussian prior on the mean. Okay, just, just it's a prior. So the prior says, I believe the mean is zero, the mean of the prior is zero, and the variance is what I call uh, new n, just some new. Now notice these two numbers are chosen by me as an agent. It's not real, it's just say algorithm. So mean zero sort of makes sense because by symmetry, you just don't know if the arm is good or bad. Now the variance is the very interesting thing. So in Thompson sampling, there's always this kind of question, 
if it's a heuristic, what's the right variance to pick, right? So how to scale this variance or scale at all? Now, the Bayesian intuition um, might suggest that if I believe my actual mean is scaling down at the order one over screwed in, I should probably match my prior variance to this object that I'm trying to model. So it turns out the natural scaling there is to make sure that the, um, the variance is also like one over n. Okay. And we call this smooth Thompson sampling. Why smooth? Well, because essentially it says at any n, my prior variance is always on the order of my randomness in the mean. So it kind of smooth it out, has regularization, has randomization. And in practice, if you run this thing, you will see the algorithm exploring like quite a bit at the beginning because you know it genuinely believes that the, uh, the, 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 the mean has the same variance as the prior. All right, so what we call probably natural. So anyway, so in this case, you can actually apply the random change theorem and get this very simple expression for a one dimensional Brownian motion for Q. If I have time, I'll probably dive into this fraction, but I want to get to the main results. So for now, just say, okay, let's just say that applying the general theorem, this is a relatively clean expression. And it turns out we can indeed analyze it. So phi here is the CDF of Gaussian, and you get this kind of stuff. Q mu plus WQ divided by square root Q plus sigma C, sigma, so something like that. Okay. Now, another option is to let the variance just explode. So I will let the variance scale by n to go to zero, one over the uh, variance. So this is the same as just saying that even though I know the mean reward is going down at one over screwed n, I don't care. I'm just going to assign a huge variance compared to that for some reason. I don't know why, but that, that's something you could do. And in fact, somehow like in practice, you could kind of justify it. If, if you look at the, um, the, the kind of a celebrated agarol oil paper, um, one option there they do is just set variance one for all n. Just fix variant to be one. And clearly in our case, this will make C go to zero. That's one option. So in this regime, it's what we call under smooth. It's a very aggressive regime. So here your prior variance is washed out. It's so big that what it essentially says is Thompson sampling quickly start being very greedy in this kind of appropriate sense. It becomes very greedy very quickly. It ignores the fact that I didn't know my prior and whatnot. Okay, so it's very sensitive now to past data. Okay, and um, again, in this case of C equal to zero, um, we get another kind of diffusion. And this is much more challenging to CMX point, uh, point um, and to Anad's point, I guess, because um, here you actually cannot directly use a theorem I proved to you earlier, but with some additional work, exploiting the uh, actual feature of the Brownian motion, you can show that as C goes to zero, the limiting distribution of this diffusion is still well-defined. And this is a very crazy process, I have to say, at least for me, anyway, not being an expert in the field. This is a process that is not Lipschitz continuous as zero and has pretty wild behavior as zero. Okay. As you can see, when Q goes to zero, this thing kind of gets very interesting. Oh, but anyway, this is the limit of the under smooth Thompson sample. All right. So can diffusion asymptotics, being the tool it is, tell us how to choose the prior? Smooth or under smooth? Which one's better? Okay, let me show you some plot very quickly. I won't go too much on this. So here's a plot just running that experiment. And on the left column, these are under smooth, uh, sorry, smooth. So new n is on the order of one over uh, screw root n. And here I'm just doing very irresponsible things, same mean reward, but new is just one. It's huge, huge variance. Ah, you see something interesting. So here, the, uh, reward is actually positive. So this vaccine is good. You want it to give it to as many people as you can. So in both cases, the thing shoots up to one eventually. But here, hmm, interesting. So the vaccine is bad. You want to cut it off at some point. Then you see that the smooth version cuts it off pretty slowly. It's not actually clear where it ends really. I mean, I mean, we, we see it now, but if you let it go, like who knows how, how it goes. But this one you can see actually dies very quickly. It's very, very different. It just shuts off the arm, right? So this is the diffusion approximation. And by the way, the, the different shades are just like finite system versus the limit. Oh, interesting. So what's happening here? And just another plot, you see this even more clearly and kind of dramatically. So on the left chart, I'm plotting regret as a function of mu. And the darker color is smaller C, smaller regularization, more unsmooth. 
under smooth. And you kind of see that the black one being c equal to zero is basically optimal when mu is bad, and not really optimal, but pretty good when mu is big, uh, positive. Whereas the red ones corresponding to c strictly with greater than zero, this is smooth Thompson sampling, you see um, doing well in one regime and doing terribly in the, in the other one. It actually blows up to infinity. When you have a very strong signal, but a negative signal, it actually blows up to infinity uh, for the re regret. Okay. Uh, and the right chart is about the drawing frequencies. Um, I guess I won't go too much into it, but suffice to say, you see some kind of asymmetry. Depending on mu is positive or negative, there's a bias. Uh, and, and I think this is also a fairly well-known fact now that, that happens with this type of algorithms to have a bias. All right. So these results suggest that they actually do perform differently. By the way, every result I'm showing you is from the diffusion approximation, okay. the diffusion limit. So we now show this actually in theory in what we call the super diffusive regime. So what we want to kind of understand is one better than the other. Well, in the sense that if I actually let mu just go through the entire real line, does one perform really badly while the other is kind of robust? So this is what we call super diffusive in the sense that we first take the diffusion and you get the diffusion, then on top of that diffusion, you tweak your mu and see what happens. So this is kind of two-step limit. It's like slightly faster than diffusion when mu is very big, uh, but it's still in the diffusion limit. All right, so here's what we get, which, which is I think is very interesting uh, for, for this particular problem. So let R be the limit regret, meaning I do the diffusion and I look at the last time step t equal to one. And as the theorem su suggests before that this actually is kind of capturing the real regret, then almost surely the following happens. If I fix c equal to uh, greater than zero, then as mu goes to negative infinity under this smoothed Thompson sampling, actually regret blows up to infinity. It's very bad. However, if mu is going to positive infinity, then the regret is very good. How good? It's any polynomial factor slower than one over mu. It's roughly one over mu. Now, if I have c equal to zero, the under smooth Thompson sampling, then the two regime collapse and they're both very good. This kind of corroborates what you saw earlier. c equal to zero does well in both. c bigger than zero does very badly when mu is negative. Okay, all right, so this is what I just said. Well, it seems to suggest that under smoothing, maybe counterintuitively, it's, it's not even using the variance at all in some way, actually provides far superior regret. And by the way, I'm not setting variance to infinity right away. It's in the limit, it kind of tends to infinity, the variance. In practice, this probably suggests that smooth Thompson sampling can be a bit risky, unless you know your mu is in some nice set. And diffusion limit also shows the root cause if you look at the proof. Uh, cause is very simple. It turns out smooth Thompson sampling just doesn't shut down the arm fast enough. I guess in retrospect, you kind of understand, oh yeah, it doesn't shut it down. Um, but it wasn't very obvious when we started analyzing it, especially this is sort of like a popular Bayesian intuition, like, oh, we should do the right thing as if it were Bayesian. Whereas under smooth Thompson sampling, you can actually show that it does. And that's kind of interesting. And another remark is that um, if you dig a little deeper, again, this is just one arm, so I'm not trying to extrapolate too much. But if you plug in the parameters from the Manor testicular lower bound in 2004 on any stochastic bandits, then it suggests that the best you can hope for is a decay of mu, um, the rate of decay in mu is log mu over mu. And we got something like anything poly divided by mu. So slightly faster than that. So it's nearly sort of optimal in this, region, in this sense. At least for one R. And just to contrast this to, as far as we know, some of the algorithms known to achieve this, uh, such as the UCB variant by Oyer and uh, Honor in 2010, uh, it requires much more sophisticated balancing uh, time kind of uh, adjustment and dropping arms and so on. So we were kind of pleasantly surprised that this is even true for Thompson sampling, just so naive, just chugging a very big variance around it and turns out to be almost optimal here. All right, 
So um, I'm going to wrap up real quick and I just flash a few like other observations. I think I've covered the most important thing. So here is just, you can also use this limit to derive some qualitative insight. So here you can actually say that essentially, regardless how strong your signal in the super diffusive regime, Thomson sampling always can be arbitrarily bad near zero. In fact, it will be arbitrarily bad, but eventually kind of learns enough to recover. So it suggests as a very volatile kind of sample path in some way. And you can actually see that in simulation, these are just sample path of the diffusion approximation. And you see like this guy right here is just getting stuck. And in fact, it's supposed to go up all the way to one, getting stuck. And here you also see a lot of oscillation. It's supposed to go to zero, but it actually believes it's very good for a while and then realizes it's actually not so good and so on. So it doesn't have a very smooth profile. It's very, very volatile. And we don't understand the details yet about this diffusion. We have some kind of high level results like the one I just showed you before. All right. So then with the two or more arms, the diffusion limits are actually much more complex. So this is what you get for two arm Thompson sampling. And we're still working on this. This is our, our current effort to understand what's going on here. It's just substantially more difficult to analyze because this kind of stuff in the denominator is much more uh, time dependent. Because in two arm, I guess T matters now because you, you actually need to remember how long it's been. And we, we're making some progress, but still a long way to go. And uh, nevertheless, you can simulate it. And it seems to be running all the simulation that what we suggest earlier between the difference between um, under smooth and smooth Thompson sampling, the, the bad regime where one does well and one doesn't do well is actually the, the true regime. So if you go to two arm and we conjecture for K arm, indeed, um, what we reported in the one arm case is gonna hold. Meaning it does matter a lot whether you uh, scale your variance right way or not. And, and so here we can see that the, in fact, the under smooth Tom sampling does extremely well, almost optimal, essentially it is optimal. Whereas everybody else does worse, but it's not clear if they're gonna blow up if we continue the simulation. Okay. All right, so a very quick summary. So we've talked about a framework for analyzing adaptive sequential experiments. And the results allow us to get some interesting predictions and, and new insights about Tom's sampling in this regime. Uh, we're very excited to uh, investigate a few uh, future directions and are currently looking at extending this kind of insight to general K-arm or at least two-arm uh, doing inference with the diffusion limit and other analyzing other algorithms and heuristics beyond Thomson sampling. Now, the final minute, I wanna do a quick, um, somewhat uh, shameless rallying call and advertisement. And um, this is something I feel like a lot of people, let's just, See, we, we go to conference these days in our community. There's a lot of learning. There's a lot of excitement around learning in, in this community. And I do feel like I'm going to chime along and to say that somehow I'm also learning this. It's somewhat new to me. But I found that um, the tools that we get uh, in stochastic modeling and way of thinking is actually quite powerful in tackling some of these more complex learning systems. Okay. So, so, so there's some recent work that um, we've been doing. Um, essentially applying these techniques in stochastic modeling to understanding uh, experiment design with uh, capacity constraints. Uh, another paper using mean field limit to understand causal inference when there's cross unit interference and this paper that you're looking at now. Um, I do wonder, is it just because people are looking at these problems or there's some kind of intrinsic value? And I guess I do believe that there's intrinsic value. I feel um, as a community sort of would bring these tools that are better suited for modeling complex system that wasn't able to be tackled before. So that's sort of a, my rallying call and sales pitch right here. All right, so that's all uh, that I have to tell you. And the paper is on archive. And if you have any questions, absolutely feel free to, uh, to message me. Uh, I'm very sorry about the meetings. I actually feel pretty good now. Maybe I should have given a talk before, but maybe I would just uh, pull the party line, go to hospital. And I would love to connect with all of you. I would reach out to you individually hopefully find a, a time slot in the next week or so. Great, thank you. Thank you, Quan, so much. Uh, so we have time for a few questions. Uh, so so I have carry? a question. Oh, okay, sorry. You had uh, Dan. Oh, maybe they were clapping. They need to carry, uh, okay. Go ahead, Santiago. Vinit, you, you had a question? Is Vinit around still? Uh, no, I was just uh, just clubbing. <laughs> okay, good, good. 
So then, so my question is, how does your result kind of uh, contribute to the analysis, the regret analysis of Thompson sampling? No. So, in some sense, I can use your methodology to get a better handle of what's the constant at which regret you are converging to to regret that the other the traditional analysis doesn't shed any light to. So traditional analysis gives you okay, you you get regret of this order. But the contents are loose, so that's kind of what you can improve. Yeah, very good question. Um, in fact, I'm still trying to figure out. This is actually something I really was looking forward to discussing with you all um, today, which is sort of how, what, what does it really mean? And in fact, it's not very clear. In Kuhn theory, we derive like diffusion limit. Uh, that what do you use the limit for, right? So here's some conjectures I have. So one is I think this is super diffusive stuff. It's kind of interesting and new in the sense that you have to have a diffusion limit to even articulate what's happening. So I guess it just opens up kind of new regimes you can look at. And as you said, maybe you could also do it in the classic kind of like worst case analysis. I just don't know how, and I don't know how precise of a chisel that you have. So essentially you're right. I think this line of work really gives you a microscope of some kind to exactly pin down the limiting distribution. And then you can do cool things with it. For example, if you're a PDE person, you can simulate, you can do much more powerful numerical simulations on these things without having to actually run like thousands, thousands of runs. Uh, another way to point out is that I didn't really emphasize this point, but it comes, comes for free, which is remember I said that the reward has to be only blah, 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 and have a forced moment. So that's actually very convenient. I don't have to, because uh, most of the analysis I know of for the finite end, you actually need to be very careful. It's like beta per nulli, Gaussian arms, you need some assumptions on these things to make it tractable. This one's very, very robust. You just throw some distribution at it. It's IID, has a fourth moment, done. It's the same diffusion limit. So it gives you this re universality as a byproduct of having this diffusion limit, which again is why people use diffusion limits to begin with. It's nothing new for us, but that kind of leverages the same, same, uh, same idea. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I have Hi, a I question. Oh. oh, sorry, sorry, Hong, you first. Oh, all right, um, Kong, so building off of this analogy between local asymptotic normality theory and your results, do you anticipate being able to show lower bounds on some of these constants and it been allowing you to show tight optimality guarantees with this refined chisel? Yes, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I didn't do a good job in, in this one. Uh, we didn't do a good, good job, but uh, uh, if you look at the proof, I think you can chisel much better. <laughs> Uh, for, for example, the one arm thing, but, but, but I do agree that for higher dimension uh, stuff, uh, we just don't know how to tackle it. It's much more complex. Like this psi function is very complicated, so I wouldn't be too optimistic. But in theory, yeah, you should be able to. Yeah. Hi, Kwon, I have two questions. Yeah, first, sure. first nice talk. First question is that maybe I forgot your comment on the setting that the fixed budget problem instance Regret bound. Maybe I, I may missed that part because, like, at least in best identification, people develop regret bound uh, probe instance, upper bound and lower bound for the prob prob probability of incorrect selection. So that's my yeah, first. Question. Absolutely, it, that's to... exactly our motivation. Actually, people do have the bounds. We're just looking for an asymptotic regime, an object that gives that kind of bound. We're we're making the point that the current known asymptotic, which is the Robin Lie asymptotic, somehow isn't right for that. And we're hopeful that the diffusion thing is. In fact, uh, Dan, your own paper um, ha has the same flavor. So you get exponential convergence in best arm if you fix the instance, but then you get like one over screwed at T uh, convergence if you look at finite sample, if I'm correct, something like that. So but it's the same exact philosophy here. A finite time bound is for the is minimax results. It's not problem instance results. I mean, people study like a problem instance finite time results. That's yeah, absolutely. So that's exactly the exciting part. So what we were trying to do is essentially, you can draw an analogy with inference and statistics. We want to have an object that allows us to do minimax kind of inference. So you take the object and when n is large enough, this object always looks like the real system, regardless what mu is. And that's the one thing that the log n limit cannot do. But, but the finite analysis does do. So we're exactly in that park. We're just providing an asymptotic object. I'm happy to chat offline. This is too confusing. <laughs> I'm probably not making a very solid point here. I see, thanks. Well, another question I have is that in, in theoretical stats, I learned something called a uh, local asymptotic analysis. 
for the, let's say for the fixed set of data. So I want to comment is there like theory for the local asymptotic analysis for the, for the depth setting? I guess it might be related to. This is exactly what we're trying to explore. I, I don't really have a good answer at the moment. It's a bit raw, but definitely, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's absolutely uh, some direction we'll look at. Uh, I'm less familiar with that literature, so I probably won't be able to give a very good answer now. Uh, I see. So I guess that's, that field is in, in infant, infancy. I don't know, <laughs> I guess. Oh, I'm yeah. sure there are experts here who know much better than me. It feels like Quang just, just built it. This is the most local asymptotic analysis. Of yeah, I guess that's the hope. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, this is the right one. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thank sort you. of like, can, can I ask a, a follow up question to that? No, kind of related to this is um, it sort of feels like uh, you should get the, the essence of the interpolation between the hour at all result and the lion robbins result has to do with how big mu is in your two arm thing. But if mu is big, you kind of just know what the right arm is almost immediately. And if it's small, um, you're in that minimax case. Can you kind of, I, I don't know, has, has that been sort of useful? Can you see that coming out in the analysis of these algorithms? Uh, very good point. So indeed, I think to look at one way, it's kind of in the definition that this limit comes from doing finite time analysis for this, the subset of parameters where mu is very similar to each other. Let's put it this way. Right. So if we think about what we are trying to achieve typically in limit analysis asymptotics, is we wanna say we, we grow some n, n gets very large, and then we get some limiting object. And we say, hey, this limiting object better be very similar to a large n finite system. However, it's very difficult if you have more than one parameter there, you get n, Let's say you have another parameter mu. So typically it's not true that you can do whatever you like with mu and still get a limit. You have to carefully specify what these other problem parameters are converging in order to get the right limit. In Q in theory, very similar. You, you look at the horizon goes to infinity, but then you can't just let traffic intensity to be crazy. It has to be very precisely also convergent to give a, a meaningful limit. And that's the same way. So again, what this does not do is like you give me an arbitrary and and like a really, really bad mu, like mu is like 1000. Well, then who knows? This probably doesn't look like a diffusion. But if you give me arbitrary and pretty big mu, but then mu n is mu divided by square root n, then this gives a nice prediction. So it's kind of like really applying to this moderate signal regime and not just global uh, sort of universal finite time analysis. It's just, we actually don't know another such limit. So this could be the first one. There could be many other interesting limits actually. So. Good, thank you. If there are no more other questions, so then thank again, Quan, for a great.